So this is probably the only lecture that you're going to have in micro lab. Um, this is kind of a new course, so to speak, and we're changing up the textbook and this is going to be the virtual lab. Uh, this chapter covers so much of what we're doing is really important. Uh, you can't get into your virtual lab until after, after census date. So that gives us some time to go through this and go over some basics of the lab that we need to know. OK, and then this will be reinforced in your subsequent labs that you're going to do online. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we will kind of take a more traditional test on this, um, although the other ones will be very different. So this first little section here is going to be very different than the most of what we're doing in lab. So just know that ahead of time. OK, I'm not going to be lecturing all through lab. All right, so microbiology lab has some very unique challenges to overcome. Um, things like having uh, habitats uh, like soil or the mouth have different types of microbes all living together in close associations. So we've got to be able to separate those different species out and figure out which ones belong there and which ones don't, which ones are actually making you sick. Also, these microbes are small and they require unique growing conditions so that we have to grow them under artificial conditions. They're so small that we can't see them with the naked eye, so we have to use a microscope. <clears throat> Lastly, we have microbes everywhere, so it is very easy to have contamination in your experiment, which will give you very misleading results. All right. So we're going to look at the five eyes of microbiology, the five basic techniques to grow, manipulate, examine and characterize microorganisms in the lab. These procedures allow us to handle and maintain accurate representations of microorgani microorganisms. OK, so the first one here is going to be inoculation. OK, inoculation just means a sample is placed into a container of growth medium via inoculation. There's other methods to inoculate as well, uh, but it just means you're putting something into something. That's the basic way to understand that. <clears throat> so the medium that it is placed in can be solid, it can be liquid, it can be a live animal like a chicken embryo, different things there, okay? Then we're going to have incubation, okay? We're going to need to incubate it. So an incubator is going to create the proper um, environmental conditions for growth with respect to like temperature, gas requirements, that type of thing, okay? It's too hot, you might kill the bacteria, too, too cold, it may not grow well. Um, and if it's if it's a virus, you have to put it in something different altogether. All right. So the next one is isolation. We want to know what we are treating. Uh, if you've ever had a strep throat or if you've had a UTI, what do they do when you go in? They take a swab, they take a urine sample and they grow a culture. Why do they do that? Why do we grow a culture? Well, it's because they want to know exactly what they are treating so that they can give you the right medication. OK, and they also want to make sure they get the dose right. All right. So it's very important. So we want to isolate and get what we call a pure culture. Once the culture has grown, uh, you may have to be re-inoculated and incubated in a way that you can separate species and that you can get just the one that is potentially pathogenic or making you sick. OK, <clears throat> then inspection, inspection here. OK. Um, we're going to have what we call colonies of growth on agar or in broth um, that have to be observed macroscopically, macro meaning large, with our eyes. And then we have to look at them microscopically. And sometimes we have to use a stain. In fact, very often we have to use a stain so that we can differentiate one from the other. Uh, and so that brings us to our last I, which is identification. We need to be able to identify it. The identity of the isolated microbe is going to be determined, hopefully, um, usually at least to the species level, but definitely to the genus. Uh, inspection can be enough to identify some microbes, but most will need additional techniques um, and include other things like different biochemical tests, immunologic tests and genetic analysis. All right. So we have to know what we are dealing with in order to treat it appropriately. So here we go again. Inoculation. This means to grow or culture by introducing a sample of the organism, which is the inoculum, into a container of nutrient medium. In this case, uh, the medium is going to provide that that hospitable environment to allow the micro organism to multiply. 
So any instrument used to sample must be sterile so you don't have uh, contamination, okay? Um, you're going to get a clinical specimen, and that's going to come from things like bodily fluids, like peritoneal fluid, um, cerebrospinal fluid, blood, or discharges, which is going to be sputum, urine, or feces, uh, or swabs from anatomical sites like the nose, the throat, your genital tract, um, or even from a diseased tissue like an abscess or a wound, okay? So the species are then inoculated into the medium and grown for the purpose of identification. So from time to time, I'm going to include some of these NCLEX prep questions. Be sure as you're reading the chapter that you read them as well, because I may not include all of them. In fact, I know I won't include all of them. All right. So let's take this into consideration. A physician has ordered a urine culture to be taken on a client. What is the most important information that the nurse uh, should know in order to complete this collection of the specimen. All right, so think about the things we just spoke of. All right, so what would be most important here to know? Date and time of collection, method of collection, and whether the client is NPO, which means they've not had anything by mouth, or the age of the client, okay? So think about what we've just been talking about. Pause, come up with your answer. All right, so if you said B, you are correct, method of collection. In other words, is this urine sample clean catch? Okay, could there be anything contaminating the specimen, in other words, all right? So this is gonna help you to see why some of this information is relevant and gives you some good practice as well for some of these entrance exams. So the next I is incubation. Once the medium is inoculated, it is then going to be incubated, which means to place it in a temperature controlled chamber, the incubator, uh, to encourage it to multiply. We want to grow it so that we have plenty of it. So microbes grow in all sorts of different temperatures. However, most temperatures used in the lab are going to fall between 20 to 45 degrees Celsius uh, because that's where most, pass, most pathogens um, are happy to live in. Okay, that's the temperature that most of them like. Uh, incubators also could control uh, the amount of atmospheric gases. Um, a growth on a medium like an agar plate uh, is going to be where we're going to see the appearance of colonies, uh, and we'll get into that in a little more detail. Uh, in a liquid medium, you're going to see cloudiness, sediment, or scum, okay, or a change in color. Okay, so during incubation, you're going to see some type of growth and multiplication producing this visible type of growth in the media. Okay, so some really important definitions here and there. I said really important again. You should count how many times I say that. No, don't do that. That might distract you. Anyway, pure culture. So this is a growth medium where you have only a single known species. So that it's pure. It's only that species. It has, it has one microbe in it, okay? A mixed culture is going to be a container that can hold two different types of identified microbes that are easy to tell the difference between. All right. And we often see in the lab, we have contaminated cultures. All right. So this is one that was once known and this has happened. I can't tell you how many times, uh, but it has somehow gotten an unwanted microbe and it has become contaminated. All right. <clears throat> so here in this picture, you see the illustration of this uh, here in A, you see this pure culture over here. The first on the left, uh, you're going to have three tubes containing pure cultures of Escherichia coli, which are going to be white, the first one on the left, and then in the middle is Micrococcus luteus, which is the yellow growth, and then Serratia marcescens, which is red on the right, okay? I like to use Serratia in class because it's really easy to identify because it's the only red one we're growing, all right? Um, <clears throat> so a mixed culture then is going to be a container that can hold two or more easily identified differentiation, differentiated species of microorganisms. So here we have a mixed culture of uh, Micrococcus luteus, which is the bright yellow one here, okay, um, and E. coli, and E. coli are the white colonies. And so it's a little hard to see, but if you look closely, you have bright yellow and then some white colonies. Okay, there's some there, but like right there, some white, right here, some white. It's kind of hard to see, but but it's there. Okay, and so that's the E. coli. All right, they're faint white. Um, and then lastly, there is a contaminated culture. Okay, and that's where it was once pure and now something has gotten in it and we don't know what's gotten in it. So we have microbes of uncertain um, identity introduced into it. 
This is easy to do. This plate, this is serratia marcescens. It was overexposed to room air. So it, that could be done by leaving the top off too long, okay, of your Petri dish. Um, it's developed a white uh, colony subsequent to that. Um, contaminants can get into cultures when, like I said, the lids or tubes of uh, petri dishes or test tubes are left open too long, allowing airborne microbes to enter. Um, and that's not hard at all. If you have your, your, your lid, you're going to just barely hold it open as you run your utensil there along it. If you open it up all the way, you're breathing on it, you're getting microbes right there coming right out of your mouth, okay? Um, so you have to be very, very careful. Um, <clears throat> you can also get it by not properly sterilizing your equipment, your inoculating loop, right? That's the tool I was just talking about that we most often use is the inoculating loop. Um, so you maybe you touched it or you accidentally reused it or you laid it down on the table, okay? So then it has gotten contaminated. Very, very easy to do. So some microbes only have a few things they need for growth. They're low maintenance, others are more complex, okay? Uh, and so we're gonna have different types of media to grow things in, all right? So media is gonna be, uh, culture media is going to be in found in things like test tubes, flask, petri dishes, okay? And then we're gonna inoculate them using loops, needles, pipettes, or swabs. Um, we actually use all of those in the lab and we do need to use sterile or what we call aseptic techniques. Um, we have microbes that cannot grow on typical media. Uh, that's going to be like viruses because they have to have a, a, an animal cell to reproduce in. They've got to have some type of a cell to reproduce in. Uh, some types of bacteria. Um, those are going to require cell cultures, growing them in a cell or host animals. Okay, we'll look at more of that later. Um, sterile or aseptic techniques are vitally important to prevent contamination. So our media can be in different states depending on what we need. We can have a liquid, semi-solid or solid. Liquid media is going to be a water-based solution. It's not going to solidify at temps above freezing. Uh, and it will flow freely when tilted, okay? Uh, a semi-solid media is gonna be firmer than liquid, but not quite as firm as solid. Uh, it's not gonna flow freely. It will have a softer consistency, a soft consistency at room temperature. That is often used to examine motility or movement of bacteria or provide a place to see reactions occur. Um, solid 1.1 1 to 5% agar is gonna remain kind of in place if it's tilted. Um, we also have what we call reversibly solid, meaning that it can be converted back to a, a liquid with heat or it can cool and re-solidify, which is very handy. Um, it's going to provide a firm surface. A solid media will, pro will provide a firm surface for discrete colonies to grow on. Okay. One of the most common things that we're going to use is going to be agar, which is that polysaccharide. It's a solid at room temperature, but melts at about 100 degrees Celsius. So we can heat it up and it will re-solidify at about 42 degrees Celsius. It's not a digestible nutrient for the microorganisms, but it provides a framework to hold moisture and nutrients. So it's kind of more like a house. So here are some examples of these different types of media. Okay, liquid and semi-solid and the solid reversible to liquid. Um, <clears throat> liquid, you can see growth member as cloudy or sometimes flakes that settle down to the bottom, which we would call a precipitate. Uh, these tubes here um, on the left here in A have urea broth um, to see, and their, their purpose here is to see if the enzyme uh, can digest urea, okay? And when it does that, it releases ammonia. And this ammonium is uh, very closely related to ammonia, NH3 versus NH4. Um, and so that's going to change the pH of the broth, and that's going to cause it to become more pink, as you can see here. Okay, so this first one here is uninoculated, so that's what it looks like with no nothing put in in it. There's no microbe there, no reaction. Um, the middle is a weak positive, okay, and the right is a strong positive. If you had a negative, it wouldn't change color; it would still look like this. All right. So that brings us to the semi-solid. So this sh shows, this is going to be sulfur in doli, which is a motility medium. All right. So it's going to be what we call stab. So we're going to stick our, our probe down in it, okay, to the inside. And location of growth is going to indicate whether or not it's modal. 
whether or not it can move. So let's say we stab it down to here. If it grows right there, it's not modal. If it grows all throughout, it's probably modal, okay, which means mobile, same thing. Um, and so you can see that it ranges here. One is stabbed with inoculum and incubated. Uh, location of growth two shows that it does have some mobility. You can see this white line is moved up here. Um, three, if you have H2S gas, a black precipitate is then going to form. Okay, if you have hydrogen sulfide gas, and that's what you see on the far right. So, um, <clears throat> so this is just showing you where you have a more solid substance. You heat it, and then it is going to be liquefied. So the content of your medium is important, or your media, I should say. Media is basically the living and food requirements for a particular bacterium um, or microbe. Some are low in maintenance, like I said, and some are high in maintenance that need special items, okay? So uh, some like to have oxygen, aerobic, and some are anaerobic and cannot be in oxygen at all. And then we have basically everything in between. Some can metabolize sugar. Some need unique things like methane um, or sulfur as a food source. Uh, so we're going to look at the different types here. We have defined or synthetic, and that means it is made with a specific chemical composition, a recipe. Uh, it's a basic media here, but it's, it's going to have a specific recipe, a specific exact formula to follow. Okay. Um, it doesn't vary much at all. It's going to be pretty much the same every time. Very precise. Next, you're going to have complex media. Okay. Complex media. Um, and so if even one thing is added without a formula, so if I just throw in some sugar, okay, then it falls under complex media, okay? So this can include things like blood, ground up cells, tissues, meat extracts. Um, these are going to vary from batch to batch, and it does not need to be an exact formula. Okay, so examples of this are going to be nutrient broth, blood agar, <clears throat> and McConkie agar. So this is an example of a defined media here. This is for growth and maintenance of staph aureus, staphylococcus aureus. Okay, um, and so you can see there's a very specific amount and type of amino acid. 0.25 grams of cysteine, histidine, leucine, phenylalanine, proline, tryptophan, and tyrosine. 0.5 of these particular amino acids. I need 0.12 grams of these particular amino acids. I got to have these vitamins. I got to have these salts, etc. I got to have a pH of blah, 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 blah. Very specific recipe that you cannot veer from. So this is an example of a complex media. It has parameters, but they're not near specific. It doesn't say, I gotta have all these different amino acids. It says just throw some, you know, about 27.5 grams of brain and heart extract, extract, some peptone, some sugar, some sodium chloride, but I'm not being extremely specific about exact measurements of exact amino acids and different types of things. So we can also have some general purpose media that allows the growth of kind of a broad range of microbes. Usually they're going to be a complex media. Uh, this is going to be like our nutrient agar, which we use a lot, uh, our nutrient broth, um, the brain heart infusion, triptych, uh, soy agar, uh, that type of thing. Okay. Enriched media, however, is going to have extras like blood. So these are going to be a little more high maintenance microbes here. Um, you're going to need hemoglobin or special growth factors in order for them, but like vitamins and special amino acids that certain bacteria need in order to grow. Bacteria that are high maintenance and they need these special items to grow are what we call fastidious. We can also use this in the clinical lab in order to grow pathogens that are present only in very small numbers. So here's an example of two different types of enriched media. We have blood agar uh, here on the left that is growing bacteria from the throat. Um, and here we can see some bacterial co colonies. And then you have this kind of halo of a uh, clear area in the picture. And that's because this particular bacteria um, is going to do what we call hemolysis, which means it breaks down red blood cells. Lysis, loosen hemo, heme meaning uh, basically referring to blood, okay? This one over here is a chocolate agar, and that brown color actually comes from the blood being cooked. 
um, and we're not going to have the hemolysis going on here. This is used for something like Neisseria species, which is the species that causes gonorrhea. Selective media and differential media are two other types of media that are made for special groups of microbes. These are used for isolation and identification of a genus or species in a single step. So selective media has um, certain agents or one particular agent that will inhibit the growth of microbes, but not inhibit others. So it will stop certain microbes from growing. So if I was, for instance, to inhibit uh, the growth of A, B, and C, but encourage or allow microbe D, we would then be selecting for D and make it very easy to identify because nothing else is going to grow there. OK, so this is important to speed up isolation when a sample has potentially many different species coming from something like, say, feces. You're going to have several different species of bacteria. Many, you know, are supposed to be there. And so you need to uh, inhibit the growth of those and select for those which are potential pathogens. OK. Um, also from areas like saliva, skin, water, soil. You want to suppress the unwanted background, so to speak, organisms that are supposed to be there and favor the growth of the uh, desired ones, which are going to be the pathogenic ones. Differential uh, media don't necessarily inhibit the growth of bacteria or microbes, but they actually display visible differences in how they grow. And so this can be differences in colony size, differences in size or color, which is what we see here, gas formation, um, formation of a solid precipitate. Um, simple differential media can have up to two different reaction types like color change. Uh, in some colonies, but not in another. Some can have up to three to four different reactions. So, um, for example, if uh, microbe X will metabolize a certain substance that is not used by microbe Y, then microbe X will cause a visible change in the medium and Y will not because it reacts with the material. Uh, a single medium, however, can be both selective and differential, and that's what we're seeing here in this picture. This is McConkie uh, agar. Uh, so these can suppress the growth of some organisms and then also produce a visual distinction in the ones that do grow. So this is a selecting agent um, here against a gram positive bacteria, which we're going to learn all about the difference between gram positive and gram negative. But it prevents gram positive from growing, but it also is then going to differentiate between bacteria that can ferment or use lactose, which is that bright pink or reddish reaction you see, and bacteria that cannot, which is the off white. To me, it looks more yellow colony here. OK, and so that's very, very helpful. Here's an example. Over here in A on the left, you have a mixed sample that contains three different species. Strict them onto a plate of general purpose, non-selective medium, where all species can grow. Um, <clears throat> here on the left, oh, sorry, you can't see my mouse. Here on the left, everything can grow. This one is selective, so only one of them will grow, OK? Um, only one species grow. And then over here, we have the mixed sample, OK? So we have the general purpose non-differential medium here. So all species kind of have a similar appearance. And then on this one, we have the uh, differential um, medium here where all three, all three species grow, but they have very different reactions. So you can see blue and red and white, OK? Um, and so this is how they work a little bit different from each other. So as I've already said, the medium can be both selective and differential. Uh, dyes, however, are really good differential agents because they are often pH indicators. And those are a pH indicator is going to change color when something changes uh, acidity or basicness. So if an acid or base is present or produced by a microbe, which often occurs, it's going to cause a change in color. So if the McConkie agar has a dye that is yellow when neutral or pink when red or acidic, um, E. coli, for example, will give off acid when it metabolizes lactose in the medium. And so it will grow pink colonies. Uh, salmonella, salmonella, however, here does not give off acid, and so it will not turn red. 
So let's see how much you're paying attention and let's try another NCLEX prep question. So a patient that we think has a UTI has a urine sample collected and sent to the lab for culture to encourage the growth of scant, which means very few pathogens in the sample. Um, that means we don't have a whole lot of bacteria uh, or whatever we think we have in the sample and enriched medium may be used. So which of these following substances um, need to be present in or may need to be present in an enriched media. So pause this and write down your answer. Oh, and by the way, it says choose all that apply. So you may have more than one. All right, so if you said A, B, C, and D, you are correct. It's actually all of these. Some other miscellaneous types of media that we may encounter include things like reducing media, uh, transport media. Uh, reducing media contains something that absorbs oxygen or decreases the amount of oxygen um, that gets into the medium. So this is important for bacteria that are anaerobic, that don't like oxygen, okay? <clears throat> Um, transport media is used to preserve microbes for very lengthy periods of time or sustain a very delicate species. This is a good example that we actually use in the lab. Um, I'm trying to remember if it's in the virtual lab. I can't remember, but this type of media have sh different sugars in them that can be fermented, which means they can be converted to acid. And so this includes a pH indicator to show the reaction that occurs. So the medium is designed to show fermentation, which is acid production and gas formation. So you may notice this little red tube in here, okay, that's called a durum tube, and that will collect the gas as it forms, okay? Um, and so the medium is gonna change color in the presence of acid from red to yellow. Uh, gas formation then is monitored by placing that little uh, durum tube upside down in the medium. If gas bubbles are there, you, they'll be formed and collected. You can see that right here, okay? So this is the control. So this is what it looks like when you get it. This is more alkaline, which is basic. This is acidic, and this is acidic and gas producing. So that helps narrow down the field of what type of uh, microbe you are looking at. We also have assay and enumeration media. Assay media are used to test how well antimicrobial drugs and things like disinfectants work. Enumeration me uh, media are used in a more industrial and environmental uh, component to look at the numbers of organisms and things like milk, water, food, or soil, uh, um, other samples as well. And this is gonna be where you would check for something like coliform bacteria. If you happen to be on well water, uh, you sometimes get letters in the mail where they're checking if they're too high in these, they get in trouble, so to speak, and they have to change things and put you on um, a boil order, that type of thing. So that's important in industrial applications, not so much for us in the lab. So isolation, this is based on the idea that if an individual bacterial cell is separated from the other cells, it will produce a discrete mound of cells called a colony. And so we're gonna have, my, Yep, a plate here, okay? And so you're gonna have these little round things here. And as long as they're separate, we call that, and it should be more round, but it's kind of hard to do. That is a colony, okay? Imagine those are perfectly round. That is a colony, and we can assume that those have, if we have done our techniques correctly, grown from a single uh, individual bacterium. This is important, one, to make a pure, to isolate pure colonies. Two, we can count colonies and estimate the size of the infection, which is really important because that can determine the type of treatment, amount of treatment, and duration of treatment. So a colony is a macroscopic cluster of cells appearing on a solid medium that comes from the multiplication of one single cell, so they're genetically identical, all right? So um, isolation requires us to have something that's got a firm surface, a Petri dish, and an inoculating loop. So we'll often do this with what we call the streak plate method. Okay, so a small drop of culture is for a streak plate. A small drop of culture is going to be spread over the surface of the medium with an inoculating loop um, in a pattern that gradually thins out the sample, it kind of dilutes it and separates the cells over several sections on the plate. So you can dilute the amount so you can get single colonies to grow. 
Um, that's the goal. The goal is to allow a single cell to grow into an isolated colony. So here are some separation technique examples. Uh, streaking can be used to isolate single cells. That is the purpose of a streak plate. After numerous cell divisions, um, you'll see this little uh, colony here. These are colonies. There's that nice pretty circle I was looking for. Okay, you can actually see those with the naked eye and then we can measure those and count them, okay? Relatively simple, but, but yet very successful way to separate different types of bacteria in a mixed sample, okay? So here's another illustration of some of these um, techniques that we're going to be used, we're going to be using. So separation techniques like streaking can be used to isolate single cells. And you'll see you go in a particular pattern. You're going to take this inoculating loop here and you're going to uh, pass it over the medium gently in this manner. And then you're going to take from there and go into this manner. And so as you're doing that, you're kind of diluting the sample. And by the time you get to four here, you can see you've gone four different directions. Um, and so hopefully you have diluted your cells and you start with a lot here, but then you get individual samples here and you can actually pick that up with an inoculation loop and then try to grow up your sample from it. Okay, because you can see you've got red and white and yellow here and they're thin enough. They're not touching each other. You can actually pick it right up. Okay. Um, and so simple yet successful way to separate those types of bacteria. Um, so that's a quadrant streak plate there on the right. I mean, at the top, um, in the middle is a dilution method here, okay, which we use for poor plate. We're going to look at how to do that um, and how they would uh, appear on the plates. And then this is what a spread plate would look, look, look like, okay? So these are just three different methods, and we are going to do lots of these. So the inspection and identification point, microbes can be identified by looking at their appearance, by characterizing their cellular metabolism, what things do they break down, what things do they not break down, by looking at their nutrient requirements, products giving off during growth, do they have certain enzymes, and different uh, genetic or immunologic characteristics. And so we also have what we call a serial dilution. Um, this is going to be, if we look at the difference between a loop dilution or pore plate, pore plate is the terminology I usually use, and the streak plate is that in this technique, some colonies are going to develop deep down inside the back, inside the medium, because you are putting it, pouring it in there. In the streak plate, you're taking the bacteria and you're streaking them on top of the agar. In a spread plate, you're going to have this little metal spreader, and it's going to be used. You're going to take a small volume of liquid from a diluted sample um, that's going to be pipetted onto the surface of the medium and spread it around evenly, okay? So the cells are kind of pushed into separate areas of the surface, giving us individual colonies. So by the second or third spread plate, we're going to do the serial dilution. The number of cells per volume is decreased in Enough to allow bacteria to grow into separate colonies.